If I gained the world but lost the Savior, were my life worth living for a day? Could my yearning heart find rest and comfort in the things that soon must pass away? If I gained the world but lost the Savior, would my gain be worth the lifelong strife? Oh, earthly pleasures worth comparing for a moment with a Christ-filled life. Verse 2. Had I wealth and love in fullest measure, and a name revered both far and near, yet no hope beyond, no harbor waiting, where my storm-tossed vessel I could steer. If I gain the world but lost the Savior, who endured the cross and died for me, could then all the world afford a refuge, whether in my anguish I would flee. Okay, introduction to this song. We'll, we'll pick up on, on, on it again another time. We'll have our evening special. And I know you wanted to say something, so I'll have the microphone here. Well, it's just a real joy to be able to play this song. And you all have a copy of the words um, that our guys passed out for you. And the name of it is, Is Your All on the Altar. And this is one of like 50 songs um, that a, a pastor in Benton Harbor wrote in 1902. Um, his name was Elijah Albright Hoffman, and I think that's a really cool name. But it's taken from Scripture, Romans 12:1. So it's it's a song about examination and celebration. So I just ask that you would all be blessed with the message of the music and its meaning. So. This is for the glory of God.
Thank you, Wendy. We really appreciate that, and thank you for sharing the words with us. That's a blessing. I, I have a favorite verse. It's verse 2. It says, Would you walk with the Lord in the light of his word and have peace and contentment always? You must do his sweet will to be free from all ill on the altar your all must lay. I can tell you this, and this will make more such sense as we re-engage our our study in James, but uh, you can be assured that if this is true, then you will not have to worry about committing the grave sin of spiritual adultery. So the song is perfect and a great segue into our study, so let's pray as we look. Heavenly Father, once again, we've been blessed uh, in, in that in many ways, certainly the testimonies of your people and joy that is ours to be able to sing together, certainly to gather together, to fellowship with one another, privilege of praying, I mean corporately and publicly, and certainly the, the, the joy and privilege and responsibility that we have to pray for one another, and uh, oft during the course of the week. And uh, we're so privileged to have the inscripturated word of God. We're so privileged to have Christ. And really, in light of the song that we've just uh, listened to, we are privileged to offer ourselves as Paul commissions us on behalf of you in Romans 12. We're, we're really privileged to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable service. And then it's interesting, that text, because we get to verse 2, and it couldn't be any more um, uh, in, in tune with and relating to where we are at in our study of James, where, where Paul writes under the inspiration of the Spirit of God and instructs God's people to stop being conformed to uh, this world in which we live. So we appreciate what you've already done, and now as we open up the pages of your book, we're careful once again to ask for the Holy Spirit of God's help. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. Our study in James, of course, continues. We are presently hovering over verse 4 of chapter 4. You know, I love the terminology, and we do a lot of hovering together. We're hovering over the creation account. We are, on Wednesday nights, uh, hovering over um, blessed psalms, and on uh, Sunday nights, we're hovering over James' teaching, and a lot of times his... (coughs) Teaching is extended enough and significant enough that we spend some quality time even with a single verse, and such is the case with James chapter 4 and verse 4. Um, take, take a look as I read James 4 and 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. We've noted, and it's powerful, James begins the verse with an interjection. Ye adulterers and adulteresses. And, of course, we noted that James here is speaking of the grave sin of spiritual adultery, the possibility that you and I may have another spiritual lover. And that with a view to the fact that we are betrothed, yea, married to the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, I've just cited with you, I think, probably the most blessed analogy in all the Word of God. As God compares your relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ to that of the bride and the bridegroom. It was worth the trip, and this is two weeks running, for you and I to pull aside from our busy schedules and perhaps today a restful day to be reminded of the fact that we are married, and we're not married to just anyone. We are married to the one and only Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. I think one of the things I was pressed to do tonight uh, with you, sort of by way of introduction, although we again have been here and we've uh, seen some things already, 
I, I think that I can succinctly remind you here of ancient Jewish marriage custom. A custom that James and his readers certainly would have been very, very familiar with. For you may recall that James, he's writing, of course, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. But he's writing to Christian Jews who are scattered about the Roman Empire. Ancient Jewish marriage custom, it consisted of three steps, you may recall. The first is the betrothal. And you've heard that described, and so too we have described it as somewhat of a glorified marriage engagement, where it really carries a lot more weight than our engagements presently, is that with the betrothal, a couple were legal, legally bound, legally bound. They were viewed as husband and wife. In other words, they were married with the betrothal, but what's interesting about the Jewish betrothal is that the couple were actually physically separated from each other for an extended period of time while the groom went usually to his father's house and put an addition on his father's house in preparation for his bride. It's a beautiful, beautiful analogy. And we are at every turn reminded of it, but the no more blessed text that sets forth not just this first step, but actually all three steps in the love letter that the Lord Jesus Christ left you in John 14. Verse 2, you recall, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Catch this, we'll use the terminology uh, probably repetitively over the course of the next few moments, but catch this, the Lord Jesus Christ paid the bride a price. And he did so with his shed blood. And in that purchase, if you will, remember Paul, I just was rehearsing this devotionally this afternoon. Remember Paul says succinctly and pointedly in 1 Corinthians 6, 20, you are bought with a price. The bride price. The Lord Jesus Christ, it, it cost him everything to be betrothed to you. And thus we are married from Christ, married with Christ, and we are temporarily, physically away from him as he's gone to his father's house to prepare a place for you, his bride. And he's poised and ready to return. We often emphasize it. And, of course, you know that this is a reference from a biblical and spiritual standpoint to the rapture of the church, which is eminent. The Lord Jesus Christ could return any moment. He is the groom coming to receive his bride. It is the second step in ancient Jewish marriage custom. First the betrothal, and then, and you know it's my favorite part, the taking of the bride, where the groom returns from his father's house, having built an addition thereon in order to literally and physically take his bride. Again, the rapture of the church, which is imminent. We read about that in the love letter, the next verse, the first part, again, verse 2, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, that's step one, the betrothal, the purchase, and everything else. I will come again and receive you unto myself. That's step two, the taking of the bride, and receive you unto myself, that where I am there ye may be also. Which is really the third step, the celebration, the consummation and the celebration of the marriage where Christ returns from heaven, his father's house, snatches his bride away, and takes you to heaven. And then begins this third 
step in ancient Jewish marriage custom, the marriage feast, the consummation of the marriage, and the festivities in regard to the greatest of all things. Seven year for us, a seven year, normally a seven day, sometimes seven years, for us a seven year celebration in heaven. And remember that once Christ snatches you, by the way, you are absolutely thrilled about this, right? I, I know I'm not always a good communicator, and I know that you don't always read my heart, but we're talking about the most exciting thing in all of life. And you do realize this, right? Because we long for that one whom we believe in and have not seen. He's away from us. You do realize this when he returns, step number two, to take his bride. And he ushers you into step number three, the, 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 the marriage feast. You do realize that from that point on, you forever will be with this one who loved you and gave himself for you. Never separated again from the Lord Jesus Christ. What a wonderful and amazing reality. And to think that we know that. We're not talking about things that we just wish about. Again, the concept is so beautiful that we couldn't even devise it from a human standpoint. And then to know that everything that we have just cited is hinged upon the precious promises of the Lord Jesus Christ and that he actually wrote it down so that we could read and reread over and over and over again. And be reminded in such rereading that we are married to the Lord Jesus Christ. But can you imagine Christ, the groom, having first purchased you the bride price, if you will, via his shed blood? Can you imagine? the groom, the Lord Jesus Christ, betrothed to you, having gone away to his father's house to prepare a place for you. And by the way, you know that that isn't just broadly dealing with the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, but the reason why we have the plural nouns in John chapter 14 is so that you and I, even as individuals, would embrace and revel in the reality that God is preparing your own special dwelling place, your own special room. Can you imagine Christ first purchasing you and I and absolutely transforming our lives, right? And going away to his father's house to prepare a place for his beloved bride, only to return and find us in the arms of a strange another lover. committing the grave sin of spiritual adultery. And by the way, this, the, the sin is so grave and again so far removed from us we think that I think that we might respond to this the way that Israel often responded to God in the Old Testament and the Old uh, Covenant setting. You may recall, for instance, that the prophet Malachi records on behalf of God and says of Israel, he, he, he says to Israel on behalf of God, Malachi says on behalf of God to Israel, you have robbed God and Israel in disbelief in turn responds by saying, how have we robbed God? And here in James, I think that it would go like that for us where James says, you adulterers and adulteresses, you have committed spiritual adultery and us responding in disbelief. How have we committed spiritual adultery? Well, listen, James, again, you know he's not going to let us get away with anything. James actually and most practically answers that question, and he does so right here. He says, we have committed spiritual adultery by developing a friendship with the world. 
take a look at the way in which James expresses it. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God, whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. We begin with a semantical observation. One of the key words here, as you can tell, is the word friendship. And by the way, this is interesting. I'll probably allude to this a couple of times over the next few moments. And what I'm speaking of in connection with that statement is a number of you are, te- are attending Pastor Rick's Sunday school class dealing with bridge evangelism. Bridge evangelism is also known as friendship evangelism. And so those of you that are in Pastor Rick's class, you see an interesting dynamic here as James continues to uh, issue the clarion call that you and I must not be developing a friendship with the world. And what does that mean in contrast to the high calling of God on our lives to be building bridges into people's lives in order to uh, share Christ? How does that... um, relate to, again, the high calling of God on our lives to actually develop friendships with people who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, where the intent of that friendship is to introduce them to the one and only Savior. Well, obviously, and I think this will become clear as we proceed, but obviously, you know, James very much is addressing something different than You and I embracing the high calling of Christ on our lives to build bridges into the lives of those who so desperately need Christ. And even developing a friendship with them, again with the intent of sharing Christ with them. But you guys are good and there's probably no confusion here. And I probably, having having taken you that far, I probably should go ahead and insert then that the friendship of the world, and we're going to look at the word, and that will make this even more clear. The friendship of the world that James is speaking of here, and I remind you in regard to this world, that this world in connection with its system, by the way, James doesn't say, um, James doesn't warn us about having a friendship with the worldling. He warns us about having a friendship with the world. And I remind you that in regard to the world then, and you know this well, that James is once again, re- 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 uh, once again referencing this world system that you and I live in. And I remind you that Satan is the, the head honcho in regard to that. I remind you that Satan actually is sporting temporary power over the world system. In other words, this world in which we live, it's not a stretch to say that it's actually satanic. Sorry, I I was mixing Greek with that. I was, believe it or not. Satanos. Satanic. That's what James is warning us where you and I... uh, Oh, and i got a lot of things I want to say to you here where, where, where you and I begin to do what the worldling does and even to think, I think that's where it starts, even to think like the worldling thinks. Where we become subservient to this wicked world system within which we live. Where we start talking and acting like the worldling, and before too long, the worldling can't even distinguish that we are a Christian, that we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, yea, that we're married to him. Hey, are you married? They would think not. Because of the way that we're choosing to live our lives. That's what James is pursuing here with us. He's not talking about us with godliness and with high calling, the idea of us building a bridge into uh, someone's life with the intent to share Christ, but rather warning us that because of the world in which we live, if we're not careful, it won't be too long before we actually, and here's the meaning of the word, where we actually have more in common with the world system within which we live 
than we do with God and the things of God. By the way, you know this, why we won't get in trouble with building bridges into people's lives, why we won't um, violate any biblical principle when we um, pursue friendship um, e evangelism is because we're taking God and the things of God with us. And so we're okay in that realm. Can you imagine, I'll reemphasize this a couple of times now, can you imagine us having more in common in light of who we're married to, in light of the purchase price, in light of what he has done, in light of what he has made us, can you imagine you and I, God's people, having more in common with the world system within which we live than with God and the things of God? James calls that spiritual adultery. We arrive at a grave sin of spiritual adultery by developing a friendship with the world. You'll be interested in this. I'm now I'm back to semantical observation. Man, I took you on a track. We're back to the semantical observation, which I introduced you to probably 10 minutes ago. Friendship and and the word friend uh, related, obviously, here in our verse. Greek word phileo, part of the reason why I share it with you is because it should ring a bell. It comes from phileo, which I probably could ask you and you probably could answer that, that that's actually one of the Greek words for love. But phileo is interesting, and again, you can see why James uh, selects, and he's doing so under the guidance of the Holy Spirit of God, but you can, you can see why James selects this particular term. The term, as you probably recall, relates to the idea of brotherly love. That's why almost always when we cite it, we also cite the city of Philadelphia, which is supposed to be the city of brotherly love. If you've been with us and you've uh, been here as we've discoursed the various Greek words for love, which includes, obviously, phileo, then you probably recall me saying that there's nothing inherently wrong with this particular word for love. It simply speaks of the love that almost naturally exists between those who have things in common. That's the... And that's why James selects this particular term and why he does so with pointedness because what he wants us to be thinking in regard to this tremendous challenge is what I've already shared with you, and that is shame, shame, shame that you and I, having been bought with a price and having been betrothed to the Lord Jesus Christ, could actually have more in common with this wicked and sinful world within which we live than with the God who has purchased us. James says, Ye adulterers and ye adulteresses. John's words certainly come into play, right? You've probably thought of them, 1 John 2.15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. In Romans, Wendy, Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and stop being conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You do realize, don't you, that in regard to your earthly soldier, there is nothing more important than the will of God. Who would have ever figured? But here we are. And I think in some ways we view it as a game and miss the gravity. 
where day upon day upon day we develop a commonality not with God and the things of God but the world in which we live. In light of the gravity then, and I shared this with you last time, James presents his teaching in such a way so that it's a choose you this day kind of thing. There's only two. How many times have you heard from me? Oh, if you had a buck for every time that you heard from Pastor Tom, there's only two. There's only two. You pick one. There's only two to pick from. And here it is again. You either love God or you love the world. You either are developing a friendship with God or you're in the process of developing a friendship with the world. You be a friend of the world and that makes you a spiritual adulterer. You be a friend of God and that makes you an awful lot like the Old Testament patriarch Abraham who God, whom God said of he is my, do you recall? Friend. <laughs> Abraham, the friend of God. You can go back on your own to James chapter 2 and verse 23. Abraham, the friend of God. There's our choice. It's only between two. You can't love both. Kind of like, like what Christ said, you, you know, in another realm where he said, you can't serve both God and mammon. You, you can't serve both God and and all of the things, all of the attractive and glittering things of this world, you can't serve both God and, and, and money. You know, if money is your God, then God is not. And so it's uh, choose you this day. And I'm just asking you, I'm not trying to be, uh, you know, overly dramatic. I, I'm just asking you if, if you would join me in recommitting ourselves to our marriage. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, James. Uh, words are pointed and even grave. But we've seen something, and it really warms the heart, especially the hearts of those who truly love you. Because even this grave teaching is presented within, a, within the construct of a beautiful and wonderful analogy, perhaps the best in all of Scripture. And that is that our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ is likened to that of the relationship between the groom and his bride. And oh God, I pray that we would be faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ who is temporarily away from us preparing a special place for us, his bride. Enough said. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take our choral collection and, and close with a verse of 26. 26 in the white choral collection. Standing please and singing together. I am resolved. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have alert my sight. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest I will come to thee. Brother Corey Sisko, will you please close us in word of prayer? Dear Lord, just thank you for everything you do for us, Lord. Your, your mercy and grace is incomprehensible, Lord. It just totally abounds to us more than we can understand or think. And you've said many times your love is... is there's no way we can go that it won't reach us and it won't cover us completely. Just thank you so much. Thank you for the reminder. Just thank you again that uh, we can be your friend, Lord, that you want to be our friends. Uh, please help us to be your friend and not friends with the world. Please help us to remember also that we're called to be in the world but not of the world. Please let us remember our friendship is found in you and be sharing the light and salt to the world that needs uh, 
something that tastes good and something they can see, Lord. They're wallowing in darkness and filth and don't realize it. Please help us to live for you and take it seriously. Amen.